Welcome back to another episode of God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. I have a phenomenal female here, which is a treat for me. I've ran men's communities for seven years, talking to dudes and really get to highlight a whole nother side that I really feel like I'm serving. When I work with men, women are already very great at being, uh, not just focusing on one thing, like they wanna be healthy, they wanna have be great spiritual leaders. They want to, a lot of times, connect with their spouse and others, and it's these hard-headed dudes that get in the way of that. And, and I, it's just such an honor to have who we have today because what she's done is gone from a ministry side, but also taken her talent and things that she's passionate about and put it out into the marketplace in a way where it's turned into a very successful business. And I believe that all of those steps, while... She's also a mother and a wife in ministry, <laughs> successful in business, maybe not the normal way. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's you're, fun to be here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's phenomenal to have you first off. Mm. And I think it's just so impressive what you guys have done. Like looking at, you know, Ben, your husband, and, and Janessa here, it's like, when, when looking at you two coming from a ministry focus, which is what I had seen from mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, yeah. to you actually taking a passion and focus. Like I got into business through like hiring lots of mentors mm -hmm. and like really grinding it out, figuring out the market cap and all yeah. these different things. You've had this like phenomenal talent that I've seen from the outside. Kind of walk me through, we'll start off with like, how did you start dabbling in what would be considered like entrepreneurial things? Mm -hmm. Where did it start? Yeah, so it's kind of a funny story. I say that I stumbled into the world of business and, and really hand lettering is what I do with my business. I create home decor products and stuff, but it started back in 2015. Uh, ben and I got married. We were living in Redding, California, and I'm Canadian, so I couldn't work for a year. And that's hard as a doer. I love to do things. I love to stay active. And so I had this year where I couldn't work. I was done ministry school, Bible college, and and so I had this, this lots of time on my hands, which I kind of look back, I'm like, that was a great season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very different now. But I remember just, um, I was kind of in this process of like, okay, God, like, what are we going to do in this time? And I went out for coffee with a friend and it simply started with her being like, hey, I follow this girl in Australia, shows me her phone, shows me this letterer that I don't even know who she is. And when I looked at that letter and I hadn't really been exposed to hand lettering, it wasn't really like what it is today. I remember seeing that and something in my spirit moved and I heard the Holy Spirit whisper say, hey, you can do that too. And I was like, that was weird. <laughs> it kind of felt like my own thought. It was such a whisper. And I kind of like thought about that. And so she's telling me, you should do this. I can totally see you doing this. And I'm like, huh, okay. Like I just brushed it off, but I just didn't forget about that whisper. So I go home and I just can't stop thinking about this whisper. And I go and I start following her on Instagram and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get some printer paper. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I grabbed a ballpoint pen and I just began to write and to create these like quote. And I'm telling you my lettering was so bad. I could not read my own handwriting. <laughs> like, like I was prior to this. Prior to it. Like, I, like back in 2015, I I was not I did not have good handwriting. Was it like, uh, why did your friend think that this was? Something I like have no like, idea. Like, did you have an artistic <laughs> capability at all? I mean, I was creative. I wouldn't even actually call myself creative then. I grew up like doing crafts at home, so that was like my creativity. Yeah, yeah. But and I love design, but I wasn't like designing homes or like or anything like that. I just always saw myself as someone in the ministry. So this was like so random. That's why I was like, that was so weird that she said that. And mm -hmm. then that whisper, that that tug in my spirit. So I paid, I leaned into it. You know, I could have just like ignored it, but I was like, I think that was the Lord. I'm gonna lean into this. So grabbing those paper, those the ballpoint pen and just writing. And I and I just started to turn it into worship. I'm like, I'm just gonna try this. Never had an ambition to create a business. Never had this, like it was literally like God was like, here's some bait. I'm going to wheel you in. Because if he had told me what it was, what it would become, I would have said no. Why? 
because I had such a poor belief system around business. I was terrified of business. Wow. And that started really when I was young and, and not intentionally, but there were jokes and remarks of like, you know, least, least likely person in the family started business. It was me because I would just spend money as quickly as I got it. Like I love to spend and, and I'm a seven on the Enneagram when they say like some of their weaknesses is they like to like spend money and get things. It's kind of like the thrill of things. But, um, but yeah, I just always had this belief that I would never, I was not good with money. I knew how to make money growing up. I would always do like lemonade stands. Like I was good at making money. So I think that entrepreneurial thing was always there, mm -hmm. but this belief system that I can't do that. It's not for me, it's for that person. And I would see how God would move in business and other people and I would disqualify myself because, I mean, they were, you know, doing it for years and I was comparing where I was then, where I was now with them, with, with where they were. But yeah, it was interesting. So the Lord had to trick me into it or else I wouldn't have probably done it. <laughs> I think that a lot of times, maybe if God would show them where they're gonna go, they'd be happy. But if they showed them what they had to go through, yes. that would also be not fun. But I love how this is, very organic, right? Yeah. Like the, sometimes the burden of the marketing mind and, and being in business is like, I'm always looking for like, mm -hmm. what's the market cap? Is there opportunity? And those are kind of the driving forces, which again, can still be an art, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're into building businesses, then that's the art of building a business yeah. is finding that. But I like that this is something that started without that, that, that yeah. like seed of desire that, that also kind of prepared you for something that was in the future. Yeah. We just talked about even with David, like the things that David went through prepared him for yeah. a, a certain moment. Yeah. It's so interesting. To, so kind of walk through what you've been doing since then. You're 2015, this is going on. Yeah. What made you even start using social media? Because this is a big piece of what you do yeah. now. Yeah. Because 2011, 2012, 2013, I was in ministry school. And I probably posted on Instagram like one time. Because I'm not like a guy <laughs> who's like... Yeah it's harder for me to like yeah. want to put out this content. And unless it's going to help someone, I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to post because I want to like just post. Yeah, yeah. Totally. So how did that start where you started putting out some more of your stuff? You yeah. could have kept it in the closet and never yeah. showed anyone. Yeah, I remember in the process of lettering and handwriting and learning, and it was a skill that I was developing and I got better and better as you do with skill, right? The more consistently you do it, the more you grow in it. And so there came a point where the Lord really early on spoke to me and it was actually a time where I wanted to quit. Um, I, I was just tired. I was just really comparing my gift and or where I was in the process with so many other people. And and he spoke to me, he said, hey, I I want you to give what you have. And, and at this point I was sharing some stuff online and just kind of be like, this is what I'm doing. I'm lettering a quote. And I would just kind of maybe like share one thing about it. But it was in a time where I wanted to quit and God spoke to me so clearly and he said, just give what you have. Because I was trying to give what other people were giving out. And he's like, give what you have. And it was like, you know, remembering with the boy and the loaves and the fishes and how he gave that to the disciples to give to Jesus. And Jesus broke it, he blessed it, and then it multiplied. And him being like, hey, just give what you have. Share on social media, like, just share your process. That there's no, like, share your process and encourage people. That's all I'm asking. Like. Like, don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate it. Like, just be you and share me in it. And so I just took that and I was like, all right, this is my assignment. This is the assignment that I have. And it wasn't even like that big of a popular thing back then with lettering and then encouraging with it. And so I was like, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. And, and really just out of obedience and trust that God is going to take this and he will bless it and he will feed who needs to be fed through it. <laughs> Sorry, he will feed who needs to be fed through it, you know? And so it was just, um, it was interesting just after that, seeing the progression of growth and really just showing up every single day on social media and, um, and just being faithful in the little. I think that's the big difference with people that want to grow their so social media and not, you know, that's one of the biggest questions I probably get on social media is like, how did you grow your account? And it's not like a super glamorous answer. It's like I consistently showed up every single day and I gave what I had. But at some point, it becomes something where it's not little, right? It's like at some point, you knew it became mm -hmm. a business, right? Mm -hmm. There had there had been this, this yeah. point where, yes. where that's a different transition because it's one thing to be an artist and it's yeah. one thing to be a totally. technician. Mm -hmm. There's the person, hey, I'm going to, you know, you yeah. could have just been mailing them by yourself and, you know, <laughs> continue to do that. At some point you had to like 
make that transition and go, okay, this is something that I yeah. want to build. When did you know, oh, wow, this is a business? <laughs> well, it took my husband, Ben, telling me that this is a business. I still couldn't even see it, even though people were like, can you make me a custom piece? Can you create this for me? And I was like, ha, ah, like so scared. I mean, underpricing like crazy and just being like, are you sure? Like so not confident. And Ben's like, oh my gosh, this is like, just say yes, like do this. Wow. And and Ben really has a business background and mindset. And so he's been, a, I mean, a huge part of my growth. I could not be where I am today without my husband and his amazing mindset in business. And, um, but there came a point where my, actually my father-in-law called us and he was like, hey, and he's really prophetic. And he was like, I just feel like this lettering can turn into a company and we want to buy you guys a printer for wood signs to etch out, you know, your, your, your designs on vinyl. And, and then we would put on wood signs because he had a family friend that was making thousands and thousands of dollars through wood signs when it was really popular back kind of in 2015's um, time. And um, so we were like, all right, let's do it. And so that was kind of the first step of my business. It was actually a wood sign company before it became a paper and poster product company. And so we did a lot of shows. It really just was a weak yes that I continued to give. It didn't feel confident. I felt super unqualified. I was so uncomfortable in where I was at and, and just giving what I had, right? And and so Ben was a real big like, hey, let's just start on Etsy. Like start small. Like we don't need a huge website. We don't, let's just start here and trust that God will take it where it needs to go. And so I just started on Etsy. <laughs> And I made it like a small Instagram account, a separate one for that. And, and I ran that for two years and it, it was very successful very quickly. And I was shocked and it had, it really, God had to grow my mindset. He had to expand my belief system. And in that process of just one foot in front of the other, old and bad mindsets began to fall off as I had to trust that God brought me to this place for a reason. And I had to see what he was seeing in me. And so that was a big shift. And yeah, there was a lot of trial and error in that, but it was really fun. So Etsy was great. And then we did shows. And and then when we moved to Austin, that's a whole other story. It totally flopped. <laughs> so we moved to Austin in 2017. And I thought, oh my gosh, this business is going to blow up. It's in Austin. There's bigger city. Bigger more city. People. More people. More opportunity. And uh, we did our first show and it flopped. Worst sales ever. And when you say show, what was the process? A pop up. It was like a, a pop up market. Lots of other vendors are there, and we're setting up. and And I'm like, we're gonna do so well. And it was like the worst pop up market I've ever done. Our sales were tanking. And I remember, you know, Ben was making all the signs, and I was doing. And it was just like we were working so hard for very little return at this point. We had so much inventory. And I remember Ben comes up to me. He's like, the grace is lifting. And I was like, what? My baby, yeah. this is my business. Like I created something and I'm like, you know, I, I never thought I could do this. And I remember the Lord being like, will you let this go? And I was like, no, I, I, I honestly couldn't say yes the first time he asked me. I was holding on like so tightly. And um, Ben just was like, the grace is lifted. I can't make more with sun. Like, I don't feel the grace on this. And I remember just coming before the Lord and just like, honestly on my knees and being like, God, like if this is the end, I give this to you. Like I surrender it all and we shut it down and we shut it down. And I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> I was like, all right. Wow. But then the Lord said, turn, like lean in, turn your eyes to me. And we had to set, uh, set aside some time to press in and to listen and to really look at where God was looking to like get so caught into his gaze. It's like, Hey, where is God leading us right now? And, um, that's when he spoke clearly. He said, start doing prints, start doing paper products. And it was like clear. I was like, okay. And I had done some paper on the side for my wood sign, but it wasn't like the main product in my company. So we did, and we kind of restarted from, I mean, from scratch, but the wind of God was behind that decision. And within a year, we were already making way more than we had did in the lifetime of my other company. And it just like took off from there. And, and, and was that still in the pop-ups or was that online more so? So that was all online. We stopped doing pop-ups. 
And wow. God was like, and that was, the, and we couldn't have scaled our other company. There was no way because we we're making everything. We can't mass produce. You know, you're making every sign like he's cutting up the wood, he's painting it. I'm getting the design. I'm painting it on. Like there's no, wow. like it would take like 30, 40 minutes to make one sign. Whereas yeah. one design on paper, I'm, I'm designing it and then I can mass produce it, you know, with, you know, outsourcing it. And so that was a big deal. And and it was great. It set us up for ministry because we were doing that part time. And then that allowed our, allowed us to then do this stuff with the church, which is why we moved to Austin to be part of a church plant. Yeah. And it's interesting that you had talked about that God had said, like the grace had lifted. So no matter what, you mm -hmm. could have kept working in that. And it probably wouldn't have worked that well mm -hmm. or would have felt like very work. Yeah. Uh, earlier, I was talking to one of my friends and we had talked about what if God said, like, give everything you have away. And it, it seems like it would seem so like daunting, but at the yeah. time we're like, well, if he said it though, that mm -hmm. grace would be there to provide the strength to yeah. walk it out. And, and so you would have been running without that strength. Mm -hmm. And then you you actually listened and made the transition. It could have just been a failure. Hey, it was great, 2016, yeah. such a great run. We did that back in the day, but you mm -hmm. continue. It's almost like the Israelites in the wilderness. They could have just stayed there yeah. indefinitely. And they yeah, stay yeah, there for. Yeah quite a long time. I don't think they listened quite <laughs> yeah, as bad as you were, did. It was a little prolonged. A little prolonged, but it was a lot quicker for you. Yeah. Was there ever a time like, this is quite a few years now that you guys have been doing this. Mm -hmm. I see with artists, there's times where maybe they love what they're doing, but they get kind of pushed, oh, do it this way, write this style music. This is mm -hmm. more popular. This is going to sell better. Have you ever had a time where you've, how have you stayed consistent in doing what you're doing? And have you ever had a time where you've Kind of allowed yourself to do it not the way you wanted to and you kind of had to figure that out again yeah i think for me one of my core values is to be authentic and to stay genuine and you know god doesn't want copycat versions of you know he doesn't want you to he's not a cookie cutter god where he's like copy and paste he's like no i created you so uniquely and different hmm. and when i don't express that i'm robbing people to experience a side of god that they couldn't have gotten through anyone else Wow. And so that's important in our creativity is that when we create, we're expressing who God is in a way that absolutely no one, like the 8 billion or however many people there are, could. Like only we can do that because we are made in the image of God. And that's how unique God is. Like I think when we start trying to become like other people, we're kind of banking on that like God's not unique enough in us. And like there's there's so much that he wants to express through us. So for me... I have to always kind of do that self-check. Like it's good to get inspired. And I love being inspired by other artists. And and I think that's the beauty of inspiration. It it kind of, it's like an invitation to try something or to kind of see something new. But it's not necessarily like, oh, do that exact thing. It's like, okay, let that inspiration almost like kind of stir up the creativity that's already in you to create with God a new thing. And so for me, I, that's kind of been a big thing is staying authentic, allowing other people to inspire me, but not into a place where I'm copying them exactly. And I will know when I'm trying to be like someone else, when that peace lifts, when I start creating and I feel like I'm striving and it's hard and I'm frustrated and I'm aiming for perfection, all of that I know is probably there's a root lie or that I'm believing that I need to look like someone else to be successful <laughs> and that's just like not true so really just being authentic is a big thing and genuine and staying true to who you are because it blesses people so wild and how many do you do you guys track how many customers or or how many prints have you guys moved through your guys' store and all that type oh of stuff? gosh i don't know that ben would know that number he's the no he's like the coo he knows all yeah, of yeah. those numbers but i mean it's thousands and thousands it's yeah. like really cool to see how much like god is it's all god like there's no way and He's just been so faithful as we've been faithful in it. And I know it's it's gone it's gone all over the world, which is really cool. Only God can do that. <laughs> yeah. And even throughout your your talk here, you'd talked about whispers and and breaths and words and leadings and mm -hmm. all these different things. Where did that get learned or inspired? Because even even when I first I was I didn't know about God. So I'm like, oh, I'm all in on Jesus. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know, like I had no real example. And then I met a guy who set an example for me and I was mm. like, oh, I didn't know you could actually hear from God. They just said, yeah. you could read the words on the page, but he doesn't do any of the things that he said that he did on the page. That yeah. was basically what I had heard. Mm -hmm. It's like, this seems weird. I don't think it's like this. <laughs> so it took someone kind of inspiring me yeah. for you. Was it naturally you just all of a sudden you're just hearing the voice of God and you're taking action? Was there some inspiration with it? 
what was that like and when did that start happening for you? Yeah, definitely it was learnt. My personality is definitely like go, go, go personality. Like if there's an open door, I run through the door. But I married into a, an amazing family whose last name is Wait, W-A-I-T. And he very much so is like <laughs> and slower pace. And my husband pace. is that slower pace. Even if we were talking right now, he'd have this so slow about him. Yeah. Like a, yeah. He's you know, slow to speak. And when he speaks, so you listen because you know it's going to be good. But you know, my last name is Wait, and I think it's funny. It's the Lord's humor. It's really... It's really like waiting on the Lord has been a huge thing I've had to learn. And doing business with God, you got to stay in step with God. You can't run ahead of Him. And there's been moments in my business where I did, and I learned through kind of error and mistakes and paying for it a little bit. I'm like, man, I ran ahead of God on that, and I should have, I probably should have taken a step back and waited. And, and my husband's great at this. You know, when there's opportunities, he's like, let's wait on the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? That sounds really good. Yeah. And praise God, we've done that because there's some doors, you know, we've walked through and there's some we have, some we haven't. And, and, you know, I think sometimes just because it's an open door doesn't mean it's a God door. It doesn't mean we're meant to go through it. And so I've had to learn to really wait on the Lord and say, God, is this you? And, and sometimes he will, sometimes he won't say anything and we just got to take that step and then we'll feel that like red light right when we're at the door. And sometimes it's like, no, it's a red light right away. And sometimes we're like, I feel like it's green light. And we go through and we feel that peace. But really it's staying in step with the spirit. And, you know, it's not, it's going to look different for everyone. I wish there was a manual, you know, <laughs> but it's, yeah. there's not. It's, it's your relationship with the Lord when you do business with God. With God. It's, it's pretty beautiful. Yeah. And you had talked about that you guys got into business partially because you were wanting to do more ministry. Mm -hmm. I think it's unique because everyone has these little desires that they think are not that valuable. So for the people listening, like you have your own desires, you have things that you were inspired to do or little inklings. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like those are sometimes overlooked. So like, I don't have that same desire. Like I was like, I want to get into business because I feel like this is where I'm supposed to go. Yeah. I wasn't like, oh, let me just, you know, my, my initial thing, I know this is how the business is ran, Yeah. but it wasn't like, let me try to do this so I can just fund over here for myself. Yeah. And, and I also am not, handcrafting you know <laughs> designs yeah and i never had that desire so it's so cool when i see yeah. someone who's like has this desire because it reinforces mine mm. Go, oh wow she acted on her desire mm -hmm. i hope that not everyone out there just starts you know drawing and writing and creating cards but like like what is theirs and maybe for some of them it is but like ah, that gave me so much inspiration mm. for the ministry side you walk me through when you really started I always ask people, when did Jesus become real to you? Not just something that you went to. I don't know how you grew up or, yeah. or who, you know, your parents could have been a pastor. They could have been drug addicts. I have no clue. Yeah, yeah. But when did this become true to you where you were so sold out that you'd go to something like ministry school? What was that like? Yeah. So I am a PK. So my dad is okay. a pastor. <laughs> so I did grow Sorry, up. Sorry, dad. Not the <laughs> Sorry, drug dad. addict. Um, I grew up in the church, so I knew of God, but I did have to come, I had to come to a point in my salvation where I wasn't riding on the faith of my parents and my, my dad and my family and they're amazing believers, but there was, I was 15 years old and kind of up into that point, um, I, you know, knew the right answer to everything and I knew what was expected of me and I put on that Sunday best and but there, and I, and I loved serving the Lord, but my identity got so wrapped up in serving and doing for God. Mm -hmm. And, and so really I hit burnout. I'm kind of giving you the brief version. I hit burnout. Um, at 18, I walk away from God for six months and it was just the darkest time of my life. Tried everything, nothing, nothing satisfied, nothing, you know? And so after I come out of that six months of like just crazy darkness, um, I remember. Did you like move out or like, what was the. Well, I... What were you so, like, what, just because you're burnt out, like... You yeah. Know, it's like, burnout could also be like, oh, you know what, I'm going to go rest with God. Like, what what do you think sparked the, okay, I'm going to go out and... Because obviously we want to yeah. avoid this. Like, you want to yeah, avoid yeah, this with yeah. your son, right? Like Yeah. Burnout you came because I turned everything I did into my identity. My identity was based on what I did for God, not being a daughter of God. And that's... You know, and sadly, that's a very big part of church. You know, people just live that way. And I think it was the mercy of God. I hit burnout. When I say I hit burnout, it was that when I was doing things for God, I no longer felt his presence. And when I stopped feeling his presence, I felt abandoned. And when I felt abandoned, I believe this lie that God, okay, you don't care about me anymore because I was no longer getting fueled 
you know, by works and it wasn't feeling my identity like it used to. And it was by God's grace that he not, he didn't abandon me, but he pulled back his presence and he said, do you, do you know, I still, you, I still love you. And I didn't know that. And so I questioned and then I hit, I was exhausted and I was trying, striving harder and harder. And then I just like literally hit burnout to the place of like at 17, I was like, I'm done. I don't fulfill God anymore. I'm doing all the right things for God, but I'm not feeling or feeling close to him. Where is God? He's left me. And I was like, okay, if this is Christianity. I want nothing to do with it. It was like this like cold term because I expected God to meet me in the way that I wanted him to. And I was like, this is what you want, God. And now you're not even showing up. When in fact, he never really needed me. <laughs> like he can do, he can still be God without me, you know? But I just like had this, like, you know, you have to meet me in this. And, and he did, but it was like my identity was getting fueled from works. Instead of just being with God, he's like, just be with me, you know? And, and it took me going into that season of like, all right, I don't need to be a Christian. I'm just going to go drink. I'm going to go party. I'm going to try drugs. I'm going to sleep around. Like all these things, but it never fulfilled. It, I felt so even more empty. Like obviously the world's not going to do any good for me. And so it came to this rock bottoms place in my life when I remember walking home. Um, I wasn't really, I was kind of in and out of my parents' house. I was like staying with a friend and just out all night, you know, at people's homes that I shouldn't have been at. And I was walking home and I remember this light bulb moment and I, it was like the veil came off my eyes and, the, and I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like I was just broken, did everything I would say I would never have done. And I go home and I grab the phone and this must have been God that I did this. I picked up the phone and I called the youth pastor and said, I'm coming right now. I need to talk to you. <laughs> So I get in my car and I drive there. And the moment I walk in, him and this um, lady who's one of the youth leaders, they're waiting for me. And I just run in and I start bawling my eyes out. And I fall on the floor and I just begin to repent. And I told them everything I did. I didn't care. I was like repenting on the floor, weeping. And they just stood there and they were praying for me. And they're like, all right, now God's going to fill you up. And I remember sitting there and she, the lady was beside me. And I had my head leaning against her shoulder and... I remember him just praying that God would fill me. And, and all of a sudden, this supernatural peace rested on me. And it's probably to this day a peace I've never experienced. It really surpassed all understanding. And I remember this peace came over me. And all of a sudden, I got taken into this like vision. And in this vision, this kind of in my mind's eye, almost like a movie was playing. And I saw this castle, this kingdom. And I was overlooking this castle and there was all these servants going in and out. And there was the king. He was sitting on a throne in the king's room and, and people were going and they were bringing him gifts. And then they would scurry off and go do their thing. Then they would run back and bring him something good. And he was showing me this and he was like, Janessa, see all these people. You know, they're servants and they're doing great things in my name. But at the end of the day, a kingdom cannot be passed down or inherited to servants. And he's like, you've been a servant your whole life. And he said, you know, if you did nothing for the rest of your life and were just a daughter, all that is mine would be yours. And that blew my mind when he said that. And he said, you can sit with me and not do any, if you wanted to, and just be a daughter, and that would be enough for me. And he said, daughters and sons inherit the kingdom, not servants. And it just blew my mind. It was a paradigm shift in that moment. And that was the moment I was marked as a daughter for God. And now, and then when I came out of that, it took me a year of walking out. He told me, don't serve, don't do anything, just be. Man, that was so hard. Yeah. Being, a, being a child of God, just being who God's created you to be instead of trying to fill it with doing and works. And so that really was the changing moment, the, the life altering moment encounter with God. And, and that really, I carry that being a daughter into my business. I carry that into being a mom, into being a pastor. Like I carry that identity because when you build on the right foundation, when you build business on the foundation that you're a son or a daughter of God, when you build on that foundation that you're a pastor, like when the winds come, it will not be able to fall because your foundation is in him and not what you're doing, not in a title, not in a position. And that's, you know, I'm so glad I had to come to that breaking point at 17 versus when I'm like 35, you know, like yeah. praise God. That was the mercy that that happened then. But I see a lot of people living that way still mm -hmm. where they're building a foundation that's not on the love of God. That's not on um, 
just purely just his acceptance and his love for you. And then they try to build it on all these other things. And then they try to fit the love of God, you know, somewhere else. And it's just, it's not going to stand. It's not going to take when the storms come, you know? And so that's, yeah, that's a little part of my story. Yeah. The kingdom doesn't go to the servants, but to the sons and daughters. Yeah. That was phenomenal. First off. Second, that's not very, that's very counter, counter culture. Yeah. They say even in the DISC model, D-I-S-C, like the personality yeah, yeah, yeah. types, S are like the servants, mm -hmm. meaning they're a little bit more steady. They, they relax through doing nothing. Yeah. So they just need to do nothing. And that's how they like recharge. Mm -hmm. And they say that that's the most common personality type in all the U.S., mm -hmm. but is the most suppressed because it's not allowed in the U.S. to like right. do nothing, not even yeah. in a culture. So that's very counter culture. Yeah. Though your family and everyone must have been happy to see you go from wild child <laughs> back. Praise God. <laughs> but was that weird? What was the response of people when you decided, I'm just going to be for X amount of time? And people are like, well, you're at, you're at the age now where you're supposed to be working. Like, how, like mm -hmm. what was that like? Like, because I went through a season like that. It wasn't very pop popular at all. Yeah, just like. I probably did it wrong compared to you. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone. I didn't right. communicate. I just was like. I'm going to give eight hours a day to get to know yeah. who God is. And yeah. It... What's interesting, because I, I think when I would say I have some gifting and leadership and, and some ministry, like when I went to a private Christian school and I was still attending that school. So I had all these dreams of like, okay, we, let's get worship for school assembly going. So I started that. So I started a lot of things, pioneered a lot of Bible, like different things in the school that hadn't yeah. been done before. So naturally I'm pulled on a lot because of gifting. Mm -hmm. So now I had to like lay down gifting and lay that down and say God's like intimacy with God is far greater than gifting will ever give you. And, Any pushback from people? Um, No, thankfully. I have a, I think people were kind of like confused that I didn't like go back into doing what I was doing before. Um, Thankfully, I have a, an amazing, healthy family that understood. They were just grateful that I wasn't doing my own thing anymore. And so when they were like, I, I said no to serving on the worship team. I was like, I'm not... I think, you know, thankfully there was a lot of grace behind that. People understood. So I'm thankful for that. But I understand that's not the case for everyone. But yeah, yeah it's I good think, community. Like yeah. I, I had just talked to the first female that I had ever interviewed on the show. And it was the opposite. She had ran off, to, made one mistake, one mm. mistake. And she went and confessed it to first, I think it was one of the people on staff who then said, we're going straight to the pastor. Mm. Went to the pastor. The pastor was like, if you don't tell your dad in 24 hours, we're telling him. Mm -hmm. And basically there was no, and, and it was, there There was none of that. So I think what an awesome community yeah. that you're a part of. Because I wonder what that would have been like if you called the youth pastor and the youth pastor's like, oh, we're calling the main pastor right now. <laughs> and we're calling your parents up because <laughs> yeah. this is not okay. Yeah. I don't, I didn't hear any of that from what yeah. she had went through and how, how, much that affected, right. you know, her There was outcome. one person, I will, now that I'm remembering, yeah. that didn't like. See, this is why this I had to wait on this. There was one person that I remember was like, gave me a phone call and they were pretty mad because I made a big mess. I mean, I was, I was, it was, it's like someone, a leader in your life that you looked up to. Yep. Then like, you know, did just, it hurt a lot of people, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So this one leader in the youth group, and she was, you know, already graduated high school. She was pretty upset. And I remember she called me and she's like, I cannot believe that you did that. And I felt shame, a little bit of shame. But I remember getting off that phone call. I felt God's presence on that phone call. And I knew he was with me. And I, and I could feel like that shame trying to come in and being like, oh, no, there's no going back now. You'll never be the same. And I was like, you know what? No, I, it I'm a dog. Like I have a new identity. I'm a new creation now. Like who I was is not who I am. Like that person is now dead. And now I'm alive. I'm new in Christ. Yeah. And so, you know, it never really got resolved, but I had to not get caught up in the criticism and just like focus on like, no, this is where God's called me now. This is who I am now. And some people may not understand that, but that's, you know, mercy. That's the gift of grace. Yeah. Like, you know, the cross, like, you know, praise God for the cross. Yeah. Do you think that it was during that time when you were getting prayed for by your the youth pastor and, and I don't know who else the was leader, there, but yeah. leader. Is that when you had the breakthrough and you saw that vision and that realization and that breakthrough? Because I find it that I didn't go to church. So when I first had this experience, like I got I had this big experience, this freeing. Mm -hmm. There's other people that maybe they knew God, they, they fell away and then they're coming back. And it's like, 
almost their own this oh i know how this stuff goes this stuff doesn't work for like they're they're mm -hmm. so expectant of nothing happening mm -hmm. that it's tough for them to experience that many many people will be like well i don't have that same story i didn't like yeah you know, i wasn't like homeless and then and then met god and then became a uh, rich yeah so like i just grew up in a great family and so it's very like yeah, yeah, yeah. flatlined almost mm -hmm. the relationship with god you had gone from seems like a pretty great church great family mm -hmm. off the rails and then all of a sudden you you're now saying i'm a new creation well most people would say that in the first time that they get saved mm -hmm. and then they mucked it up and then they struggle with shame yeah. maybe there's people out there that also have kind of fallen off the what would be the gas pedal of the relationship and yeah. now they're coming back right now and going yeah. Uh, how do I all of a sudden now say I'm a new creation because I thought that's what I was the first time? Yeah. When, how did that happen for you? Yeah, I think the big thing was repentance. Wow. I had to repent. I had to turn. Repentant mean, repentance means to turn away, to turn away from something completely. And so the first step is repentance. You can't have, you cannot experience the the fullness of what God has for you without repentance like that is it's only through repentance right we have to turn away to what God has for us in this this newness of life and so that's the first step is repentance and the reality is we all have something to repent for mm -hmm. and God doesn't see what someone maybe a little bit of repentance of something that maybe feels small versus something big it's all the same to him mm -hmm. and sometimes we kind of do that comparison of like oh you know, but my testimony isn't as crazy as that person. You know, it is because you repented and you turned away from something that was trying to bring division between you and God. And like all, you know, we put this whole thing on like, this sin is greater than this sin. No, sin is sin, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so the first step is just repentance. And then when God gives you, you know, when you turn away and then you, you realize, okay, this is what God says I am. That's like you're putting on your new self. That's your new creation. That is who you are. That's the new, your new person like that he says you are. And so, I mean, I don't know if it's, if I'm giving a very clear answer, but I think the first thing is really just repent, <laughs> like yeah. repent, turn away and turn to him and then listen to what he says about you and then claim that, that identity and walk in it and put on that self, like put on that new self, that that new, that identity that God has given you. Yeah, uh, one thing that you said is, is put on, see what he says about you. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that it's a feeling. It also means that it can be what he says and you declare it, right? It's yeah. like, not just, hey, I feel this way about it. No, what does the word say? And how can you just mm -hmm. continually say like, this is what it says. Yeah. I'm gonna choose to believe this and yeah. also ask God for the strength yeah. in that side as well. Mm -hmm. What did you think you were gonna be when you grew up at this point <laughs> obviously the yeah. six months probably clouded that a little bit I, yeah. I, i'm kind of interested like what did you think your future was going to be like for those six months but yeah. also what did you think you were going to do did you know you were going to go into ministry did that get shaken at all did you think oh, i'm going to go to college and well i always because i grew up in a culture that really valued the prophetic and so i knew from a very young age just from people speaking into my life the constant word over my life was ministry you're gonna mm. travel the nations and do ministry i was like okay that's just what i'm doing you know but people confirm that over and over and i yeah. just loved it i love to encourage and to speak life so even after that i i still knew the call was there i knew it was going to look different and i knew and i was okay with the process looking different and so actually up until that point, I was I was in university at that time. And when I had this encounter, the Lord spoke very clearly to me, said, drop out of university. You're not meant to be here. And I was like, okay, wow. <laughs> you know, only drop out if God speaks to you, you know? So I was like, okay, I'm dropping out. So I pulled out. Thankfully it was before a cutout that I can get a deposit back uh, like within a few days or something like that. And I remember sitting in my living room and being like, all right, God, what's the next step? Like, it was just like, I'm open for anything, God. Wow. And um, I had really surrendered everything at this point. And I remember him, he spoke so clearly and he brought me back to a memory. I closed my eyes and he said, go to Bible college. I'm like, all right, well, what Bible college? Like there's wow. millions in the world. <laughs> yeah. And I closed my eyes expecting to hear exactly where I was supposed to go. That's how much faith I had in that moment. And he instantly brought back a memory from when I was 15. So before I kind of walked away, there was a family friend who had come to Winnipeg where I was, where I was living at the time in Canada and she had told me in a conversation like we're like a very quick five minute conversation she was like I went to this place called Bethel Church you know in Redding California and they have a school there and and she was like I I don't know I just think you, you I could totally see you being there one day and that was it and I completely forgot about it after that 
And he instantly brought me back to that memory. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going there. I just, I didn't know any who any of the pastors were. I didn't know anybody, you know, that was just some of the big names that we know today. But I just was like, okay, I'm going there. I grabbed a computer and I applied. Didn't even tell my family. I just knew. And then within like three weeks, I got accepted. And a year later, I went. I think we were in school at the same time because I went in 2012, first year. Mine was 2011. Okay. so 2011 were... to 2012 was okay. first year. 2012 to 2013 was So you were year. a year ahead of me. So yeah. we were in Reading at the same time, which is Yeah. Kind of cool. And the, the, I think the classrooms were split. So like yeah. you guys were probably in the civic center. Yeah, we were center. in the civic. You were at so, the church. Yep. Yeah. So, so th yeah, that's that's <laughs> wild to think about. I'm thinking back to my own process yeah. throughout that, and and just yeah, it's wild to hear that that's the process that you took, that you heard from God that way, had that random idea. I had something similar where I met someone who went to Bethel, and when I saw them, I was like, how do I learn that stuff? Mm. It was Chris Kildosher. Oh, I love Chris. Yeah. I know Chris. So we're in <laughs> Southern California at a church birthday party, church birthday party. <laughs> and and he comes up to me and he's he's basically like, starts telling me all these things about what he does. And I'm like, what is this? Dude? Like, this <laughs> guy's this guy? crazy. Like, he's seeing all these amazing miracles. Yeah. And and so I call him and I'm like, where is this happening? He's like, well, I live in Reading. And I was like, okay. I'm going. Like, it's done. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm, I'm love going that. to Reading. Like, yeah. this is what I'm going to go do. And, and that's how I ended up meeting Amanda was actually she was going, got accepted as well. So we're in the same Facebook group. Oh, she wow. posted in the Facebook group and that's what started our conversation. That's so wild. Yeah. So you so, guys met before you even got to Reading. Correct. What? And even crazier is that Chad Dedman, mm -hmm. I always wanted to meet him. Amanda knew him because he traveled to her church in Ohio. Okay. I was like, oh, I want to meet this guy. Well, one day Chris Kildosher says, come out to lunch. I'm, I'm going to be with, with uh, Chad Dedman. So I go out there. I don't even have enough money for lunch. I don't even know how I'm going to pay for gas to like get <laughs> oh back. Gosh, yeah. Because they're in Orange County. So yeah, I drive yeah. all the way up from Southern California. Uh, I meet this guy. Chad ends up saying, hey, let's go surf in the middle of the ocean at night. Oh, he, he did it to Ben too. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> Terrible. Went and he was basically like, hey, I wish you could go to Africa and UK with us and do ministry. And I said, I already had heard from God that I was going to. Wow. So I said, me being me at the time. I was 18, didn't know communication skills. <laughs> I said, I am. And he was like, okay. And we just <laughs> went on with life. Right. Amanda was actually going on that trip. No way. I met them in the UK airport and I said, I thought I told you when we were surfing like five months ago, I said I was coming. And they're like, we don't have any spot for you. Like we don't have, you don't have your plane tickets to come to Africa. Like you don't have any shots, yeah. like nothing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but I, you said, I told you, like I told you I was going. So very, Love very it. crazy. When when did you and Ben meet in this? So I met Ben, um, two, so it was when I was in my second year of BSSM. I actually had never. Because him and I, like we went on a trip to like Mexico City. Yeah, you guys that. knew each other before. You yeah. knew my husband before I knew him. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's funny because I didn't have a car when I was living in Reading. So, and Ben was in the healing rooms every single week. Yeah. I had never been in the healing rooms up until like after I met him, which is kind of funny. But anyways, I met Ben. Um, I went on a, it was funny. I had, I had applied on a ministry trip, which you do in second year, right? To go travel with different mentors or pastors to kind of learn how to do ministry real time. And I had applied for two trips, one with Chris Fallotton, one with Joaquin, who's my now pastor here in Austin. And I wanted, really wanted to go with Chris because everyone wants to go on a, yeah, yeah. On a trip with Chris. And, and then I had a backup plan. Joaquin was my backup, <laughs> my backup plan in case I didn't get to go with Chris. Yeah. Well, I got accepted to go with Chris. Like five students got to go to Washington. Wow. And I remember getting so excited. I called my mom or like celebrating. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. It's going to be so awesome. Well, that same day, I got an email from Joaquin's personal assistant. She's like, hey, this is really random, but... We were looking through all the students' profiles, picking students um, to come to, you know, to accept to the, come on this trip. And we saw your face and we knew you have to come to this trip with Joaquin. Wow. You have to. And I was like, this is so weird. And later on, I heard like they never do that. Like you don't go out of your way to find a student that already, it showed on my profile. I was already going to another trip. And so I called my mom again and I'm like, Mom, this is like, what do I do? And she's like, follow the favor. I was like, that's good. So I was like, all right, called the Chris Valentin crew. I'm like, I'm not coming. Sorry, guys, I'm pulling out right on time. I go on this trip. Well, Ben was on this trip. And I remember on this trip, 
Ben was doing a breakout session because he's one of the leaders on this and he was doing a whole session on the presence of God and cultivate, cultivating the presence of God. And I remember sitting, making my tea in the back. I had no idea who this guy was and I'm listening. And I remember hearing what he was saying and being like, oh my gosh, I need to go sit down. I don't even know this guy, but I need to sit down. So I go up and I sit in one of the chairs and he's teaching like a group of 30, 40 people. And all of a sudden I can feel the presence of God so tangibly. And I'm like, whoa, like who is this guy? I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. And I said to myself, I don't know who this guy is, but I want what he carries. Yeah. <laughs> no idea who he yeah, was. Yeah. And, um, and so anyways, that was that. And then I just, I think we talked once in the airport because it was a big trip. There was 30 students. So we didn't really run into each other. But I, I we, we kind of had one conversation. It was kind of like, you know, where are you from? Really kind of basic. And then that was it. And then I didn't see him for four months. But Ben uh, noticed me on that trip. And he, and he in that conversation in the airport, he after I walked away, he told the Lord, he was like, God, she's cool. But if, if, if for whatever reason, you know, we're meant to run into each other, like I give it to you and I trust you. And we did three months later. And he was kind of in a season where he was learning to surrender the whole like finding the right person. He's like, God will make it happen, you know. Yeah. Well, I ran into him four months later on another trip with Joaquin because I got to go on another trip with him. And he's like, oh, she's here. And on that trip, we just ended up being on the same bus and the same taxi and the same line. Like God made sure we were always put together. You know, Joaquin put us together on the same team to minister at a church with, you know, him leading in and the three of us students. And so I got a lot of time with Ben. And, and so it was that trip that really something sparked. And then within like two weeks of that, you know, we got, he got my number, we're chatting. And then 11 months, 11 months later, we were married. So it kind of happened very fast. That's so wild. And and what year was it when you got married then? 2015, 2015. March, 2015. Yeah. We and just then, celebrated eight years. And you talked about your son's going to turn three in just like in two months. A couple months. months. Yeah. In June, he'll be three. It's, yeah. Which is Casey fun. just turned three. So oh, on that fun. similar trajectory yeah. uh, and what a cool, like, way again that God has like orchestrated your guys's relationship mm -hmm. you guys have obviously seen some amazing things we talked about Chris Valentin you'd mentioned that he's a phenomenal guy yeah leader at Bethel yeah. you guys are pastors at uh, Bethel Church here which is yeah. I think you Bethel guys Austin. only yeah. other plant here in, in yeah. Bethel Austin uh, Joaquin who is your mentor or someone you traveled with it literally yeah. is you're now now I passed. Yeah, I interned yeah. for Joaquin in my third year, and now and then we, you know, we moved down when they felt the call. We were yeah. like, "We'll go where you go," because they're amazing, phenomenal people. Which makes total sense. You also mentioned something called healing rooms for the people that haven't seen it. You can check it out at Bethel. This is where people go from all over the world. Yeah, and they had seen and and really from a guy who hadn't seen much healing, like when Pastor Bill, who is pastor at Bethel, yeah, was talking about like he didn't really see many healings he just said the, the bible says that people get healed <laughs> yeah. and he chose to believe what the bible said and that's yeah. when we had talked about even the feeling part mm -hmm. it's not about the feeling like he just was like i know that this is true yeah so i'm sure you felt discouraged when you pray for someone and nothing oh, yeah. happens totally and now they had seen so many healings and miracles and documented ones there's books that you can buy now that are documented by third-party doctors you know they have like the mm -hmm. miracle book and everything so just so that people knew the references yeah. on that yeah what what are some of the craziest things because ben has seen such amazing things i'm sure you have as well um what is some of the craziest things that you guys have seen god do either in your lives or other people's lives that maybe could just shake some people's like realities <laughs> like what kind of like healing whatever you want whatever you want you go wherever oh, you want oh my gosh I, this is this is your show i'm just i'm here for the ride <laughs> I'll man. clean up the mess. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. Man, there's been so many amazing things we've seen the Lord do. Um, I mean, a cool thing that really amazing thing that happened in our um, young adults community. We had in 2019, we had a young adults retreat. Ben and I are the young adults pastors at our church, and we had a retreat, and it was probably like the worship was so explosive. There's 80 people in the room. We were just hungry for God. And to this day, Ben and I are like, we've never felt that much unity in the room like ever before. And I remember, uh, man, so many crazy things happen. I'll tell you a couple. But <laughs> in worship, um, I remember it, the faith was so crazy in the room. I remember Ben looked at me and said, I feel like anything can happen. Anything. Like the faith was like through the roof. Anything could happen. So we're like, let's go after healing because there was so much faith for it. And um, I remember he was like, who has metal in their body? <laughs> well, two people or one person had metal in her body. 
she stood up and she's like, I have a screw. I tore my, uh, like some something about like she had messed up her knee. She has like a metal plate and a bunch of metal screws in her knee. And so we're like, all right, let's pray. So we get around her like, like all 80 of us are like around her and we're praying and we're just believing and we're declaring and all of a sudden she starts freaking out. She's like, I can taste burning metal in my mouth. <laughs> and we're like, what? Like, you can't make this stuff up. Like we didn't, yeah. no one told her to say that. She was literally like shaking. Like I can taste burning metal in my mouth. And we're like, well, check it out. Do what you couldn't do before. So she stands up, she starts squatting. She's like, I could not do this before. Wow. And then she starts looking, feeling her knee, and a one of the big uh, metal screws in her knee completely is gone, dissolves. Wow. She cannot feel it. She's crying. People are like, what is happening? Like, at the same time, while this is happening, other people start praying for other people. Another girl got prayer for um, self-harm scars. She had a bunch of self-harm scars around along her hip back in a dark season of her life that she just thought, okay, I'm gonna have to like carry this for the rest of my life. Like when I get married, I'm gonna explain, you know, kind of what happened. And um, she gets prayer, she runs to the bathroom. Every single scar has disappeared. Wow. She's weeping because she feels like God not only sees her, but he's like, I fully redeemed you, you know? And just like, oh, like so many crazy things happened. I remember another kind of fun one. (laughs) Their room was so like, I don't even know the right word. It was, there was so much faith and you could feel like the tangible electricity in the room. And I remember I was in this season of like crazy obedience. And um, like, I think a month or two before this, I was with Eddie Tate, who's our associate pastor at the church. And we had gone to Reading for uh, a conference at the church at Bethel church. And, and um, anyways, it was at that, when we were at that conference, Eddie had kind of been encouraging me like, obedience and just doing things that make you scary. Like if God asked you to do something crazy, would you do it? Like Smith Wigglesworth, who's a revivalist, yeah. who did crazy things, right? If yeah. God told him to do it, he would do it and people you'd see breakthrough. And so anyways, we're in this place and some of, one of the things that Eddie had kind of jokingly said, but then when he said it, he's like, God's on it. He said, you need to tackle this person. Like, like actual tackle, like run and take them down. Yeah. And when he said that, when we were in Reading, I was like, no, 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 no. I would never do that. Like me, like I like. Do I look like a football player? <laughs> like, yeah. Do I look like someone who would attack someone or tackle them? And he's like, no, you got to do it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think he's right. Like I felt the fear of the Lord, and my heart was beating. Like it wasn't like, oh, just do it fun. Like I actually felt like God was on it, and I knew it was like to test. Will I do it out of obedience for Him? And so we're in this like the thing called fire starters, which is kind of like a mini like equipping on people, hearing the voice, praying for the sick, and prophesying and. And, and his friend was the leader. And so he was like, you need to tackle. And I was like, <laughs> so scared. Like, do I just do it randomly? Like when he's sharing or like when there's prayer time, like, well, how do you do this? Yeah. So we're, it's the end of the meeting and there's like maybe 50 people in the room and, and he's praying and we're all praying. And all of a sudden I'm like, Eddie gives me the mic. He's like, you need to pray. And so I was like, okay. So I start praying. And then I was like, I could feel the Holy Spirit begin to like, almost like the Energizer Bunny. Like I start feeling like electricity going through my body. And then I gave him the mic and I ran and I tackled him to the ground. And then all of a sudden, the 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 um, a prophetic anointing drops on me like I've never experienced. I just began to prophesy. And all these things just began to come out. And I don't even know what I said after. It was like Holy Spirit took over. Wow. <laughs> this is kind of out there. No, I love it. But... So that happened, right? So that marked me. So back to retreat when everyone's going crazy. Goes, that so that happened. I tackled <laughs> so that... that guy and then told him about his future. <laughs> so back to the next. Well, thing. you're gonna know okay. why I'm saying this. Back to retreat. I'm feeling that same electricity pumping through my body again, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I'm supposed to tackle someone, and I don't know. This is like I'm scared again, but it got, I knew it was the Lord. Yeah. And I remember there was a kid that was there, and I remember I'm like. I just got to do it. So we were all jumping and he's just kind of standing there and he's kind of like sort of half in worship. And I just ran and I tackled him to the ground and it's cement floor, tackled him to the ground. And I just began to pray Well, he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Wow. As he goes down, never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, starts praying and speaking in tongues. And then I found out later that he came because he was forced to come. He didn't even know if he believed in God. 
But after I tackled him, he said something broke. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit and he came up and he decided he wanted to follow Jesus fully. <laughs> like wow. all because of obedience. It's nothing I did. It was just obedience, right? Yep. And sometimes God will ask you to do crazy things. And, you know, obedience is God's love language. He loves obedience. And when we obey, we are loving him because to love him is to obey him. And so obedience, if you want to please the Father, obey him. And sometimes he'll, he'll ask you to do crazy things. Just do it. Doing it for him. <laughs> and, and it's scriptural too. You, my friend Brian and I were talking and, and we had talked about that obedience is greater than sacrifice. When mm -hmm. Saul decided, oh, I'll sacrifice these things, but he wasn't obedient. And that's when God's face turned from Saul to, to mm -hmm. David. Mm -hmm. It was like that little bit of disobedience. And so that, that really hit me even with the show. And what I'm doing with King's Brotherhood is like, I knew I was supposed to shift this way. And it felt like that's what kept coming up for me is like, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Like, mm -hmm. will you be obedient? And then also with Abraham and his son, like, I thought it was so interesting that you look at Abraham, he could have just been like, God, you told me to sacrifice my son. This is the final straw. Like, mm -hmm. there's just no way. Mm -hmm. But like, he knew God so well that he knew like what God was going to do. Mm -hmm. It was like, he was confident that no matter what, it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that that was so impactful to me because there comes a time in all of our lives, whether it's just with simple obedience or tackling someone or, or <laughs> shifting into business, yeah. Yeah. that the obedience is really important or even sometimes that obedience is a sacrifice. Yeah. But like God provided the sacrifice and then immediately blessed it. It was yeah. like, Abraham, check it out. This, 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 mm. this, and this. And it's yeah. like, wow, like that's crazy. Or this, or the disobedience. It says mm -hmm. disobedience is like the sin of witchcraft. Mm. And that really hit mm -hmm. me too. And so be careful what you ask for too. It sounds like you're like, yeah. God, like I want to, <laughs> I, I want to be bold. It's like tackle for the Smith Wigglesworth guy. People can look this guy up. Yeah. Like he legitimately one time pulled out a dead body and threw it against the wall saying like, wake back up. Yeah. And it didn't. And just think about like what that would feel like. Like you really missed the mark here. <laughs> and so he did it again. And the person came back to life. Oh, and that's like, wild. I just thank God for like this guy's second throw. But like things like that, that's why this guy is like mm. next level and, and has a phenomenal mm. story. But just like, yeah. wow, what a, and, and this yeah. is what people sometimes glance over. When I say like no compromise, say in this community, no compromise in business. We don't, yeah. money is amazing. Like yeah. meaning it's the oxygen of a business and no one's ashamed to talk about it or yeah. why that, that yeah, is. Yeah, We're yeah. here to build businesses. That's what yeah. I'm here to do. Yeah. But also on the faith side, like this is a place that often people just skip over not remembering that. And like Jesus rubbed mud in blind people's eyes. Like mm -hmm. disciples healed people through sending out rags that mm -hmm. they prayed over. Their shadows, the presence that they carried or healing people yeah. everywhere they went. Yeah. And ultimately, what are people looking for when they're like looking for God? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it, they want to not, not sometimes. First Corinthians 4.20 tells us that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Mm -hmm. And this is what you're talking about. Yeah. And so I think it's amazing. <laughs> I yeah. just like, what powerful things. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that one of the things that was difficult for me, this may only speak to a small amount of people, but it would have spoke to me, is that as I got into business from this culture of, Mm -hmm. pray prophetic healing like mm -hmm. it doesn't take an, it doesn't take a skill necessarily like heal, seeing god heal someone and having faith that he can do it doesn't necessarily take a skill there's still something to it that i think is very profound there's people that do it really well mm -hmm. yet you, you, there's people at bethel they get saved and then they literally go pray for people and they get healed mm -hmm. building a business can be such a skill and it's mm -hmm. so difficult that when i left i thought oh if i pray if i want something bad enough then it'll happen like if I have good enough intentions mm. and I flopped on my face <laughs> and I had to go through this like yeah. weird season of building building a business and learning skills. Yeah. Like when Solomon hired uh, someone to work on bronze, he goes, who's the best bronze yeah. worker? Yeah. And there was this, even though he's the wisest person in the world, he needed someone else to come and work yeah. on the bronze. Yeah, yeah. How have you heard from God in business? Like how have you co-labored in that where it's you mm -hmm. hear the voice but you've had to put in the work and the skill and that's a very difficult mm -hmm. thing to balance that was my hardest thing leaving bethel was that i thought if i uh, i shouldn't put in the work because that means that i'm just doing it all on my own and i'm striving yeah how have you kind of coupled both of those things 
Yeah, I think the really important thing for anyone wanting to get into business or in business is stewardship. I think that is the I think that is a big deal to God is stewardship. And stewardship is taking what you have, taking what God's given you, where you're at with what you have and giving it your best mm. unto the Lord. That to me is co-laboring with God. You're taking he's saying, "Hey, I've given you this. What are you going to do with it?" And you're like, God, I'm going to turn this. I'm going to do something well with this. And I'm going to do it well and with excellence where I'm at right now. I'm not going to try to get 10 steps ahead. I'm going to show up where I'm at right now and I'm going to give it my best. That's stewardship. And, you know, I, was, I really love the story of David. You know, after David was anointed king, where did he go? He went straight back into the fields. He didn't become a king overnight. When David was anointed, the very next place he went to was back in the fields as a shepherd. Some could say, oh man, like he really, miss, you know, what, what, what does that have to do with the promise? Well, it has everything to do with the promise. He was tending the sheep. He was stewarding where he was at. He was doing it with excellence. He didn't let any sheep go astray. He was doing it with, with excellence and he was giving it his all and his that was his preparation and, and stewardship is preparing us for the increase. And so I've learned that with the Lord is that wherever you're at, you got to steward what you've been given. And when you steward, even if maybe where you're at doesn't look like the promise, it's preparation for the promise. And what maybe feel feels like a setback is a setup to where God's going to take you. And so really just kind of stewarding, showing up daily. I've learned, I've got to show up today. i got to steward what God's given me. Yep. i got to do with excellence. This is worship to the Lord, mm -hmm. you know? And then I've seen God faithfully in seasons pour out more increase. And then, you know, he'll stop. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this increase. I'm going to steward it. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to press in. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to do something with what he's given me. I'm not going to sit back and just pray that he, you know, does all the work. Like he's waiting on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's already done his part. He's already given me something. And so working with God looks like that. It's stewardship. You know, prayer is important in that, but we can't just pray and expect God to do all the labor. Yeah. He's waiting on us. He's already done his part. He's already provided. We just got to do something with what he's provided. And let's, let's go to that opposite person. And they're the, the grinders, people that are just like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. willing to work a hundred hours a week, totally down for it. What are some practical ways that they can hear the voice of God inside of what they're doing? Direction, leanings, like what are, maybe how do you hear? And then what have you seen for other people? Because you guys have equipped a lot of people in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting, right? We, there's the written word of God and, and then there's this alive word, word of God where God can speak to you mm -hmm. individually. Yeah. How can people out there start recognizing that where it's not just their voice, it's not just something they wrote, mm -hmm. read, but they can actually start trying to get direction and being confident in it. Yeah, I think setting aside time to do that is the first step, you know, prioritizing time with God, seeking his heart, seeking his will is so important. And and for Ben and I, we, we take a few times of the year, usually in the beginning of the year where we're like, we're gonna, we go to an Airbnb or a hotel and we just, we set aside time and we just dream with God. God, what are you saying? And we'll write down whatever we're hearing and we'll write it down. And we'll feel peace on the ones who are like, well, God's on this. We really believe it. like this is the Lord. And and sometimes there's things on the list that never happened. We're like, okay, maybe that was like, a, you know, more of the flesh. <laughs> but, but it, you know, I'd rather get a bunch of things on the list and like 90% of them are God and then maybe 10% of them are me. But so dreaming with God is a big thing and setting aside time to listen, to get, a, get away from the clutter, get away from the noise. You know, maybe that's getting outside of your house and just like, or maybe going camping if you can't afford to go you know just do something where you're getting out and you're just setting aside time to meet with him with expectancy and and then you can do that daily too when you're in your time with the lord like you know get a you know, journal like asking god like what are your promises what are you speaking to me today about my bit what are believe what can i believe that's a big thing what can i believe about my business that you're believing that maybe i'm not believing right now because your belief will take you to the next level Belief is a big part, I think, of, of that. And so setting aside time, having beliefs, asking God for the right belief system, knowing what the lies are. You gotta, you gotta get those lies out so you can believe the truth. And 
So those are some things that um, I would say, and, and wait, waiting on the Lord is a big one. Like I mentioned earlier, like wait on the Lord. You don't need to run 100 miles per hour to be successful. That's a lie. <laughs> that was a big lie that culture tells us. Like you got to be running fast to be successful. No, you just got to go at the pace of grace on your life. So good. Wait on the Lord. Uh, I think it's so cool what you've done with your son too. Uh, we had talked about that on your stories. I think it was your stories. I don't know if you posted about it, but he act, he's not even three. And he's like literally saying the fruits of the spirit. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think it's so cool to see that dynamic of how you guys have built your family, business, mm. ministry, how you guys are reconnecting through those times. And mm -hmm. I just think it's so cool. So I appreciate you being here as well. This has been Thank so you. cool. And, for and for the people that want to check out Instagram, social, as well as sites and things like that. Mm -hmm. Where can people get connected? Yeah, you can just find me at Janessa Wait on Instagram and on TikTok, Janessa Wait. And then my um, my shop is shop.janessawait.com. I also have a podcast, Encourage Your Heart Podcast, where me and my husband share a lot of these things. And yeah, we love it. We love sharing stories and encouragement. So yeah. Perfect. So if you're already on iTunes, then you can just go over to that podcast and go subscribe. Go check it out. If you're on YouTube, then hey, come over and give God's business some love on iTunes. Yes. And then go over there and subscribe <laughs> as well and double dip in both sides of it. Uh, again, if you're on YouTube, then there's actually a little bell that you could ring after you subscribe that actually gives you notifications of when we go live and when we actually are dropping episodes. Also on iTunes, if this has been impactful to you, it'd be awesome if you could leave us a five star rate and review. Or, you know, if you want to four star me, then, you know, fine, <laughs> four star me. If you want to one star me, please. Thank you. I'd love to see those one-star reviews come in, but the, the reviews are amazing and really appreciate it. And Janessa, thank you so much for thank being you. here. It's been awesome. I know it's not easy as a mother who's running a business that's a pastor to come out here and do an interview, awesome. but thank it's been you. amazing.